Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon is Central Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention. The next event is scheduled for June 24th through 26, 2002 in Norman, Oklahoma. However, they need your help to put on the next event. Please visit SoonerCon.com to find out how you can help make SoonerCon 30 a reality. The Hellmouth Convention The Hellmouth Convention is a celebration of all pop culture, but specifically things like Buffy, Angel, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. It is held in Los Angeles, California, and the next event is scheduled for June 3rd through 5th, 2022. Proceeds benefit the Los Angeles LGBT Center as well as the Ron Glass Memorial Scholarship Fund. For more information, go to thehellmouth.org. On tap today, we have Laura Banks. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. I'm glad to have you. I'm when I saw your name come across my screen, I was like, I'm I love so much about what you do. And I'm I'm gonna get started because I have a lot of Trekkies in the audience. So it would be remiss of me to not mention that you were in Star Trek too and might not be the first person they think of when they think of the movie, but they know you. They know my visual image from a picture of me that went everywhere when it first came out including the box cover in time magazine and just everywhere with ricardo montalban as his they've called me his pet mm-hmm. <laughs> uh con's pet uh yes and and the neat thing about this is you are a fan too yes well i certainly grew to be one i wasn't at the beginning and i grew to really appreciate everything related to star trek and its image and destiny with everything interracial and positive and the universe comes together for good message. Mm-hmm. And and your exact role was at a really neat point in this history because this was before next gen. Mm-hmm. There had only been one movie which had its own Rocky history. So this could have very well been the last hurrah for Star Trek, but in a way you kind of got in on the ground floor and there's been a fascination with those characters that that Khan brought on board. Yes, you know, the whole making of Star Trek II was so interesting because Star Trek I really did fail. It was a colossal flop. And many say it's because Gene had such a preoccupation with the Enterprise itself and photographing the ship and, and less to do with the actual characters and Star Trek's success. And I think even above Star Wars has always been its, its growth and development of the characters and the relationships between the characters uh, and the Asian characters and the African-American characters. And, you know, with Michelle being the first black woman in history to have the position she had within the TV series. I mean, there's just so much groundbreaking work that went on, but one really blew it. And then Nick Meyer really had his hands full to make two work. Uh, so he, he had to come in under budget and he did, and he threw himself as a writer into making it work. And I, I remember vividly a lot of the times he was very frustrated with Paramount Pictures. I worked for about a month on the movie and he was very frustrated because uh, it was an uphill battle to let the studio have him in creative control of his own project. But he fought, he fought hard and to everyone's victory. So when you're, uh, you had a, an uncredited role, if I understand correctly, Yes, I had an uncredited role along with Joaquin uh, at, with uh, Judson Scott. There's there's a lot of di- discrepancy around why that happened. I had one line, course plot to intercept Enterprise Ready, sir. And I had a character name, Wajahut, W-A-J-A-H-U-T. You can get the playing card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. I signed these playing cards they made with Wajahut on there. Uh, why? Wajah Hutt and why Judson and I did not get credit, uh, I think was a, a tremendous oversight on their part. It, it was. And, you know, since you, your appearance was so brief, I, I really feel like I want to ask, did you ever get a chance to look into what's been developed in, in your characters through the books and other literature since then? Very interesting question. If anyone out there is listening and has more information on that, I would love that. My answer is no, but my curiosity level is very high. Okay. Well, um, if, if your curiosity level is high, I would recommend the Con Trilogy by Greg Cox. Okay. Uh, the first two books is the parts one and two of The Rise and Fall of Khan Nunyan Singh. 
and your part would come in at the end uh, to reign in hell. And essentially, uh, they mentioned that your characters would have actually been mostly the children of Khan's followers because they were all so young. Mm -hmm. And most of his followers would have been killed off while on SETI Alpha 5. Right. Um, apparently, it was written in that they, the original followers were a very diverse group racially, uh, which what didn't show up in the show, but they, they made sure that was clear. And then by, because they were genetically engineered, a lot of them ended up being very Anglo, blonde haired, and through some very strange mixture of genetics that nobody could have predicted. And you were all a little bit younger than you first appeared because apparently the genetically engineered bodies just matured faster. Well, that that's a that's a great. Uh, I, I've always thought I was more of a of a of a child than a pet. I think that was just you know. Mm -hmm in other Hollywood fantasy that it would be, you know, me with some guy four times my age or something crazy, you know? So yes, I think that's it. That's, I'm glad to hear that that's kind of the thread. And, and I have heard that as the angle it's gone. Here it is. Star Trek, the original series, con number three to rain in hell mass market paperback. Interesting. I love these talk. books. I truly love them. Uh, and, and he would have been so in love with Marla McGivers that when she finally died, he would have replaced her with nobody else. So when you called you pet, he was probably looking at you as a, a niece or as a the, something of that effect. Yeah, well, that's that's and 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 Ricardo Montalban was such a pleasure to work with and 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 such a gentleman and his his rich history, of course, in Hollywood and the matinee idol that he was in his years of filmmaking. It really it really showed the professionalism and the and the, this is there was it was it's so funny he played such an extraordinarily successful character because in real life he just so wasn't uh, that mm -hmm. at all, you know. But when that camera was rolling, boy, I it, and I learned so much about acting just watching how he trained himself at when that they went to action and his energy and the the, the the you know some people just have this charisma, right? This just vibe coming off their body that they can fill a, a you know a, a room. You know, I've met a few people like that, Jack Nicholson being one, Ricardo Monomon being another. There are certain and I think that I, I don't even know who they were cast. I don't know if, if Paramount knows the good fortune they had when they did cast Montalban in that role. And if they really knew it's funny, he's of course sp Spanish. Mm -hmm. Um and he was he was born in Mexico, but he's Spanish. And I too am I am one quarter Spanish. So I'm a Castilian Spanish. And I don't, and of course, there was no way they knew that, but I always, I never thought it was a coincidence that they would put me right next to him, that I did have that ancestry of that Spanish. That is, it's, it's a good touch. And I think that when you deal with a character who is genetically engineered, there's a certain, ah, I don't want to use the word appropriateness, but there's a certain advantage to having a, Hispanic actor play a person of Indian descent. Mm -hmm. Not normally a play you'd want to make, but in this case, it, I think it just works and he had the talent to pull it off. Yeah, I guess not so PC these days. But, no, uh, but you know, when you're literally talking about somebody who had their genes scrambled, okay, it makes a little more sense. Yeah, you can get away with it in the sci-fi angle for sure. But that, that heat and that intensity, you know, that passion, mm -hmm. it just came through, you know. He was just a warrior, you know, in his spirit. And of course, he was in agony shooting a lot of the time because he'd fallen off a horse in, in movies years ago. And so when he had to do the death scene, then when you say I'm in it just for a bit, you know, I am in quite a bit when you really, if you want to find me, I'm in that fight sequence, right? Mm -hmm. Probably the most exciting, thrilling moments of that whole movie is when yes. I really, truly come to life and appear. And I'm at that console shot after shot, you know, and, and the highlight of the filming was really watching uh con you know disintegrate and and but 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 hang on there and hang on to the console as his face is burnt and he's struggling to 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 to, to stay alive to that very last moment you know it was just an extraordinary feat of of talent and physical dexterity given he was in pain with his back and how they padded the console soul for him to be landing against that and getting up again and shooting it again in the dutch angle and and uh and then when they'd yell cut you could just tell he was just so uncomfortable physically in his body and but then when they'd say action he would raise his chest up up and pump it out and just be this character again it, 
I've never since, in fact, witnessed anyone come to life in a moment when that when there was action, you know. But I've never ever worked with a character so bigger than life before. Of course, you know. I just finished making a movie with uh, Sean Young from Blade Runner. We just finished. We had a ten day shoot here down in Florida. She's of course one of my heroes too from Blade Runner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she still has she she also has that magical energy when that camera's on. You're describing Ricardo Montalban in a way it, it, it's the most touching description I've ever heard. And I would say number two would probably be George Decay mm. uh, in his first book, where he talks about how Montalban would literally go around in first thing in the morning and give everybody pep talks on set. Mm. wasn't even his place to do that he just wanted to get that camaraderie going and George had a very very strong appreciation for that admiration I'd even use wow I did I just see I did not know that and I wonder when he did that because our shooting was so separate because we used the same console of course with the enterprise working first and then they finished and wrapped so I actually didn't work with with the crew of the enterprise and then we used that same bridge for the reliant and uh, we blew it up at the end where I had mm-hmm. my stunt double come in and die. So maybe Ricardo was making, maybe he was, you know, on set, you know, watching the film. I'm sure he was. I, you'd know better than I would. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so tell me about this new movie you're in. Um, well, so this new movie is called No Vacancy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's with Sean Young. And I'm actually... Uh, and I went on to star in three movies, of course, and I had stand-ins and stunt doubles and all of my and four movies, in fact, because if you count Star Trek, I had a stunt double. In this instance, in, in No Vacancy, uh, I uh, was uh, a stand-in, <laughs> which I've never done, and and I'm so and I was a stand-in for Sean because we're both five nine, and uh, and it was such a great experience because I had not been in the room when they were actually resetting lights and setting the angles and getting the lights set. And, and that I learned so much about filmmaking in the last, uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and, and so I'm very great, grateful that I did it. No Vacancy is a story, a true story of the First Baptist Church of Leesburg, Florida, Florida that purchased a, a motel to house the homeless. So it's a true story and it's a great story. And that's why Sean took the script and it was really my forte back into the movie world that I've been out of for very long because I really um, retired in many ways from that. I went on to write, you know, three books and stand up and improv comedy with Whoopi Goldberg and everything else I've done, which if you look into my career is sort of Thomas Edison in nature. I mean, how much more could I do? You know, I've, I've just always had my hand on a lot of projects and I've enjoyed it. Uh, uh, but uh I was in uh, when Sharks Attack last year for uh, National Geographic Channel, where I played the mother of a of a of a of a son who was attacked by a shark, and it was fascinating to watch them film that uh, using the fake blood and the underwater camera, and uh, so that was that was uh, a v- very interesting. I I'm looking over everything you've done, and I have to say you're career is inspiring to me for it for no other reason than I'm the kind of person that has a million interests I have a lot of projects brewing right now some I've made public some I haven't and I'm sometimes I get discouraged looking at can I get all this done and somebody like you has you've made it work well you just keep following your dream and it's it's like loving the craft of of acting you you can't worry you're going to light up the world. I mean, I'm an astrologer. I have zodiacmagicpodcast.com. Uh, I, I co-host with Doug Stefan, who's the second oldest voice on uh, radio in, in the United States and has won a Marconi Award for his work in radio. And we we bring on all kinds of intuitives and psychics. And I do, I read the planets and talk about that. And if, if you understand astrology, you know that it's all faded anyway. That at time of birth, the planets are in a certain place and they lay out what we're going to do. And so we might as well just enjoy the ride. Some will do one thing pointedly and become super famous and super rich. And some will have multiple interests and go along with that passion of everything they're up to and and, and live in an ADD world of, of just loving it all and doing it doing it and uh, for the sake of doing it. And that's that's sometimes a challenge to be okay with. 
but it's important that you just keep checking in with your feeling zone and does it feel good when you're doing it? And that feeling zone will just keep pouring you into the moment of, of, of creation. So I did an interview that your fans should know about coming out next year, though. This is very exciting. So I had a film. So I'm in the middle of shooting No Vacancy most of September. And I get a phone call from a company that's filming a documentary that's coming out next year called 1982, the greatest movies. Uh, it's a working title. I'll let you know what the actual title is, but they sent a documentary film crew to my home and they interviewed me on Star Trek too, because this, you know, Leonard Maltin's involved and uh, Kevin Smith and, and uh, Barry Boswick and uh, uh, Henry Winkler and Ron Howard, they're all gonna be in this movie because these filmmakers came together and it's going to be at the festivals uh, because they feel 1982 really was a premier year for movies with Star Trek II, with Blade Runner, with Poltergeist, with E.T. I mean, they all came out in 1982. What were the planets doing then, right? You'd have to tell me. I'm not an expert. <laughs> on, I like movies, but I don't know about Spread Our Planets. You know, I will go back and look December of 82 when I was filming that to see what the planets were doing and, and what they were doing uh, and the release of that film. Um, I'm also in a book coming out. They interviewed me for about an hour in a book, two professors from Illinois, I believe, who were hired uh, this year recently in the last few months by Paramount Pictures to write a book about Star Trek too. It's, it's very interesting that this development uh, they, they, it was a terrific interview. They, these two, this couple just know everything about ST2. I mean, they'd be great on your show. I mean, they were teaching me stuff. Uh, and, and that will be coming out. The book will be coming out next year as well, of course, because of the 40th anniversary of Star Trek II. So you may start seeing me more places because there aren't that many of us left to tell the story of Star mm -hmm. Trek II on the actual set of The Reliant. OK, so, you know, with Ronald Bongan and I mean, Judson Scott, I could certainly tell his story, uh, but I don't know where all the other extras are and where they went, you know, but it's important to keep that story alive. And I probably hope to do appearances as well, which I used to do. If any of the stuff you've just mentioned is available online, I will make sure all the links go in the show notes on my website, AaronBossig.com. And um, if there's, you know, if I can get uh, reach out to the, the authors of that book. I definitely will. Um, so uh, you've done a lot of stuff in live theater as well. Yes. Yes. Well, theater, <laughs> uh, more in my younger years, uh, it turned out when I moved from Kansas, so I was born in New Jersey, raised in the Midwest, and I moved mm -hmm. to California. And as soon as I got to California, I discovered the comedy store. Flipped out, flipped out over what stand-up comedy was then met Whoopi Goldberg, formed a troupe. So my theatrical experience is, certainly I've done my share of plays. Pirandello, Luigi, Luigi Pirandello was my favorite play I did, uh, Right You Are If You Think You Are, which is a brilliant, a brilliant play about characterization and the multiple characters within each of us uh, and a kind of a whodunit in the realm of who are you, uh, uh, and Bertolt Brecht, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the writing of Brecht. They're, they're, but really when I've really discovered improvisation, you know, my love of scripts became secondary to my love of discovering in the moment um, characters. And it really kind of sideswiped my stand-up career, which I was in the middle of, in San Diego at the right place, right time in 1979 at the Comedy Store when Robin Williams, Billy Crystal, Jay Leno, Dick Letterman, they were all taken off right there on Sunset Boulevard. And I was honing my career as a writer. But as soon as I've discovered this, the, the improv, I, I, I didn't want to be doing the same set over and over again. So I uh, went on to pursue my career as an improvisational performer and did many, many different venues as, a, as an improv player. I had a one woman show about my work in Star Trek, which was a scripted piece that I did run off Broadway for a while. But there again, there's Laura Banks. I mean, how much can I put into a run on sentence about what I've done? <laughs> but well, that's just me. Fair enough. But I have a huge 
fascination with improv because I mean, of all the talents I could say I have, that is so low on the list. I, it, it doesn't even register. And so, but the people that do get into that, that it is their world. It is their, it's it's a, a mindset that just clicks and they run with it. It's an addiction. It's, it's, it, it becomes pathological. Clearly you, you cannot get enough of it. And, and it's like surfing. It's like now, right now, I've, I'm just coming out of what I felt was like a water volleyball coma because I've been playing a lot of ball down here, loving it for the last three years. I kind of retired down here to Florida and uh, I'm just sort of now going, wait a minute, you know, like with this movie and with my writing, I'm writing a fourth book and I'm working on my website, stargalnetwork.com, getting my message of astrology out there. I'm kind of waking up from it. But when you fall in love with something, either this really physically emotionally mentally improv a uh, sport it's kind of it's it's like the blessing and the curse right Aaron you, you, you kind of try and pull yourself out of it I mean at mm-hmm. least I do I get very passionate and very involved in what I'm doing mm-hmm. and it's and it's and, and other things fall to the wayside right but I mean that's being in the zone I think that's the kind of the way it's supposed to be you know and that's what happened with improv I totally fell into this zone of of being when you're up there and you're on stage and a moment clicks and the character and the who what where come together and 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 you're discovering the the awareness of your other actor on stage a player on stage it's 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 better than drugs better than sex better than rock and roll you're just in this zone of co-creation and it's incredible i recommend anyone take an improv class and the people who haven't been to this or or haven't thought about it would say, well, how can you teach improv? And what would be your response to that? How can you teach it? Mm-hmm. Well, it's how you teach acting. The first thing is to get into your body. It's how to, it's the same principles of really getting into your life. You know, people say actors are phonies, you know, or you can't trust an actor because you don't know when they're real. And Brad Pitt said it best of all. I've never heard of anyone say it so well. He kind of blew the whistle on the fact that actors are some amazing people that have all this understanding and knowledge and capacity for taking on characters and all that. Not really. I mean, most of us are just our true selves. We're authentic. There's an integration of our character on who, as who we are as people in the world. And that comes through. And you know, unless you're a Broadway player that recreates a moment over and over and over again, most of us are just being ourselves in the moment. And, and, how you teach that is what they teach in acting 101, which is feel your feet landed squarely on the ground, feel the carpet or the floor between your feet and the ground. And then you work your way up to what are the sights and smells in the room you're looking at in that moment? What, what are you really feeling? Like today, I kind of had an agitated day. Maybe it's coming through. I had this run in with this website guy, probably not going to work with him. Until I own that, I can't get on with being with you. So it's really about owning the emotions you're feeling, which a lot of us block. A lot of us block our emotional state. Mm -hmm. We're not in touch with it. We're worker bees. We're we're out there in the world, putting on a smile, you know, kind of lying, kind of getting through it. We people tell lies all day long, white lies. Mm if we could just drop into our bodies, physically feel ourselves, feel physically understand where we are emotionally, what's hurting us in our bodies. Like I got an itch on my toe. I can't scratch. I got, you know, I got some anxiety today. Then you can layer on that. You can layer anything into that. Like hanging out with Sean Young on set last week, you know, I'm doing her astrology charts tomorrow. Do you know who Sean Young is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Many people don't. Of course you do. Um, because she hasn't worked in a while because she got blacklisted and all kinds of crazy things happen. Well, she's not crazy. She's fantastic and totally authentic, totally herself, says what's on her mind. That's talent. That took her a lifetime of understanding herself. Yeah, I'll tell you one way to get there is through journaling. Journaling is the best kept secret. I don't know why it isn't a course offered in elementary school. If you just start writing down where you are in a day, you can layer onto that any kind of anything you want. There you go. I mean, that's how you, that's improv, you know, just knowing who yourself are. And then, then you have to learn, you know, space work. You got to learn how to act like you're picking up something or, you know, you, you have to learn to listen, which I'm not doing very well to you right now. I'm taking over this whole thing, but you no. learn, you learn listening skills. 
and you learn to yes and another great phenomena of life you, just say yes to life as often as you can it's going to work it's when you start saying no that you're living in fear and it's it's you know i you know, probably should write a uh, chapter on this in my book about the parallels of improvisation and, and having an amazing life it really does have to do with saying yes that's amazing. And I mean, I, I should just, I thought it was implied that I was a Blade Runner fan because of how sci-fi I am. But truth be told, I, I, I might just have to say, oh, wonderful movie. I love that movie to death. To death. Um, but a lot of what you're talking about boils down to mindfulness, which is a talent that people don't really understand right now and is something our culture truly needs. Well, yeah, getting off the, the gerbil wheel and slowing down and looking at what it is that is your imaginary life that you'd be living if you could be living any life. And what if you were told that you could have that life by just focusing on it? People don't know, but that's possible. It's entirely possible. I mean, everything I've done from the movies and the books and the comedy, it all started with an imagination that I could do it. I mean, I came from a dysfunctional family in Kansas. Mm -hmm. with nothing on my side to make it work. And I went out and I took a lot of courses and did a lot of work on myself and did a lot of affirmation work and did a lot of imagining. And now I'm in the process of creating a system to give other people to access the subconscious and the imagination to manifest their dreams. And it's possible. It's beyond possible. It's totally probable. We keep manifesting what we focus on. You and know, we're on a gerbil wheel of repeated thoughts patterns. I think part of it is that, you know, when we're young, you're taught you can do anything, you can be anything. But that message kind of gets redirected to, but you have to do to go to this school and get this job and fill out these papers. We, we tell people to have these big dreams, but we want to focus them straight into one specific path to get there. And that path is not the best for every dream out there. It's not, and, and we're focused on materialism. And I mean, there's so many things we could say that make it challenging, but let's just say it's possible. Let's just mm -hmm. leave it there that the imagination, filmmaking, I mean, just watching these brilliant filmmakers work last week at the Kingstone Studios here in uh, uh, Leesburg. This is a dream, it took them seven years to make this movie and they did, and the dream started we're seeing homeless people that needed a place to live. Mm -hmm. Star Trek was Gene Roddenberry, right? In its infancy, this is a man that just saw the possibility. This is a guy with a military background who saw the possibility of a world that came together. And then he made it universal. Then he made it about the universe, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, how about we get that expansive? I mean, is that genius? We look at that and we go, oh, that's just someone who's touched, right? In a positive way, in a way that none of us, the rest of us can be. Well, on some level, there is some truth in genetics and in karma right that we're all at a certain part point in our evolution which i believe but then how can we manifest our best evolution and since we're dealing with a star trek fan base here you know what was the evolution of khan you know what was the evolution of my character in that film and our lives you know we we, we made it to where you discovered us you know mm -hmm. alpha seti five right mm -hmm. And then he managed to find Kirk out there in space and have his, have his day, have his moment, have him let, 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 Shat, let, 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 let Kirk see him. I said Shatner, let Kirk see him, that he survived, that he's here and almost, okay, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't make it. He didn't win. We didn't win. We were killed. We were killed. Right. But he got Nemo. He got, you know, he got Spock. He killed Spock, mm -hmm. you know, and, and now that's the, that's obviously a horrible negative thing on this, but it all started with the possibility of something and the conclusion of something and the growth and development, and the desire. It's when we just stop pursuing the possibility that it all just, just life becomes just unbearable. And I think during this COVID crisis, a lot of us have lost focus on the possibility of our own dreams. Mm -hmm. It's been a real challenge to the spirit. I think we're dealing with a lot of depression in the world. And that's why 
you know, Trek world and, and, and the phenomena is more important than ever, you know, that we come together and that we celebrate, you know, these institutions that have given us pleasure and joy. And, you know, the pleasure and joy is not just a, a passing feeling. It's one of the, the foundations of this show that I, I contend that people who get into a fandom, whatever that fandom may be, do it because they're trying to see what they want our lives to be like. And the fandom gives them this, the, the building blocks to figure that out. Like with Star Trek two specifically, like I said, it was Star Trek had been dormant for a very long time. They had a rabid fan base watching it in reruns, but the, the, the future was very unclear. And then, you know, we have this motion picture, which is essentially a TV reunion movie. It's a little more the same. We're all glad to have it, but where are we going with this? And, and the genius thing to me is that while the motion picture was kind of more the same with better visuals, the Wrath of Khan is a movie about them getting old. It's about the passage of time. And that to the fan starts to say, we know you've grown with this. We know this is a part of your life and you might be toward the end of your life, but this is still here for you. And when you deal with the loss of your best friend, this is here for you. And, and the, the people whose friendships were shown in that movie, we want you to have those kind of friendships too. Yeah, I just get teary even thinking about that scene mm -hmm. where Spock passes. It's it it is about you're right, Aaron. It it it, it is the building blocks and the lessons learned to go out and generate beyond the tragedies that surround all of us. And my father, he's 98 years old. He's a World War II vet, and I'm watching him just having turned a corner to dementia and other physical issues. And it is a very hard thing to witness. And we come together and watch Star Trek and it gives us that community that lets us get through it together. Mm -hmm. Right. It's even an energy that comes together. There was such an energetic, you know, I interviewed William Shatner on my podcast and that was only a couple of months ago. And it was so interesting. I mean, you can listen to it. And I asked him a lot of questions about a lot of things. And really, it, we, we got on this whole track of understanding energy and understanding how thoughts have form and shape. And they go out in the universe and they create things. They've even in physics, you know, their thoughts are in S form and they go out and they like a radio signal, go out and generate. And imagine the power of a collective consciousness that lives within Star Trek and the fan base that we are to assume was sort of this accidental thing that happened around this accidental show. When in fact, what if we're all generating this collective consciousness and actually we are in some way saving the universe? Mm -hmm. What's that chance? I mean, we do not know. I mean, how many parallel universes are we living in? And forget the parallel. What if just we are collectively generating an awareness that we all interracially need to come together that we can transpose ourselves in time and space to someplace else, because that is what our thoughts are doing. They're regenerating themselves out in time and space. We can't physically get beamed up, but our thoughts are. I mean, if you put any work at all into studying the nature of energy and matter, you know that our bodies, first of all, are mostly just nothing mostly air 98 percent of dna they don't even understand what it is what is it 93 percent of our brain or more we don't even use we don't even know what it is for the the the, the earth is 97 percent unusable because it's water i mean everything seems to be this 
3% ratio. So we're living on this 3% iceberg tip of understanding of how we're even using our consciousness. People get into talking about how Star Trek predicted the future and they always get into technology and, you know, the flip phones and, and the certain, certain materials and, and that's all well and good. But I, I feel like that's barely the start of the conversation. I, I, I look at it and I see, I see a bunch of people who watched a TV show and said, can we have a world where people are more concerned with making themselves better or pursuing their own knowledge than about surviving? Can, can that be a thing? You know, instead of worried about getting tomorrow's dinner, can we worry about researching something that, that might change the world for the better many times over? That and what is, if we're doing that without doing that, Aaron? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I'm creating a program now where people can listen to it at night while, while they're sleeping. And I really mm -hmm. believe if you reprogram your brain at night, you can kind of start generating in a whole nother level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. What if we are worried about our dinners and we're worried about our, our relationships and our health and going about with our jobs? If we started to commit a fraction of understanding to the concept that if you hold on to a thought for 19 seconds, you can change your state of being. If you're depressed and if you could just focus on feeling good, which is really the work of Abraham Hicks, who's this brilliant teacher I've worked with for many years. What if we really understood that all we had to do was feel good about our future for so many minutes in a day to generate it in the world and create it for the whole universe? What a profound thought that is. What if there's nothing to learn or get to other than to learn and understand that if you feel good about yourself, that means you're living an authentic life, an authentic place. You're an authentic person. Authentic to me is just everything. It, it, it's not moralizing. It's not right or wrong, which is, I think, where we get into trouble. It means you know who you are, you're passionate about pursuing it, and you're capable of having fun while you're doing it, and that means you'll keep doing it. If, if you just did that, and I think that's why Star Trek became so popular, because I really think as much as Kirk is a love-hate kind of a, 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 well, he's a beloved character, but Shatner has had his fair share of kind of love-hate in his fan base, right? He's like, oh, God, mm -hmm. he's just a pain in the eye, you know? He brought so much passion to Kirk. Mm -hmm. that I believe that's what really propelled that program. He, he's just, in his voice and his over-the-top acting and his way he went after women and the way he went after the bad guy. It's like the, the lesson, the bottom line there is go for life with that level of passion and mm -hmm. you'll have a life that you love. Mm -hmm. You'll have a show that you love. You'll, you know, and, then, and then there's all the other stuff, right? I'm just, you know, well, what discipline do you bring to that? What, you know, who else can you include in that? Who else can you help along the way? But most of us aren't even helping ourselves because most of us don't even know what we want, mm -hmm. much less how to go after it. Including myself, I'm still struggling with that and I'm not a spring chicken anymore, you know? But I've, I've manifested to me what was a life down here, absolutely, incredibly happy to wake up and be in a swimming pool five days a week. And now I'm on to manifesting the next thing. So it's always a phoenix rising from the ashes, noticing and respecting that that is what we are, that it's always going to fall apart and to be rebuilt again. You know, the same way that happened at the end of two, you know, and on and on, you know. You're the kind of person that no matter what I'm doing, I would want to have you on my team because with this kind of an outlook, it's, <laughs> you, you, there's nothing you can't do. I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that you dedicate a lot of your energy toward helping animals and sitting here with my senior dog and worrying about her. I, that means a lot to me. Well, I do, I do support the North Shore Animal League and I have rescued uh, three dogs and whenever I can, I do make the point to, please love your animals and you know, learn how to train them so that they can respect you because they want to give you the world mm -hmm. and you just have to learn to, to, to know how to train them. Right. You know, it's, it's not a bunch of no's. They don't hear no. It's not a bunch of shouting. They don't hear shouting. 
It's, it's understanding, doing a little time to study and read a book or two on the actual commands and how to give them. And they will be absolutely the perfect pet. You know, to me, that's the biggest tragedy is, is, is people that just don't understand how to train their pet to do what they need them to do. And so they abandon them and they don't oh, no. move on to the next one, you know? So, yes, thank you for all the, your work with animals. And, and, you know, I can't say I've done a ton of work for animals. I wish I could tell you I have, but I, you know, I do, I do donate money to, to, to causes and I do donate my time to shelters when I can. Uh, and, and just talking to you, you know, I'll be remembered to do more. Well, I, just like yourself, I can only do so much. And that's probably the most heartbreaking thing for me is that I can't save them all because trust me, I've tried to figure out how I, yeah. I've, I've got space in my house for one dog and she's sitting over there happy as a clam. And I wish I could make them all that happy. Well, I think most of us, Aaron, deal with our own, I'll say misfortune or unhappiness, and it becomes a focus. It's, it's, we focus on what's missing to the point where we don't have anything to give a cause or a local shelter. And all the more reason to get this message of this great show you've put together, which is find the fun in your life and go for it and be passionate about it and do it in a way that's got you full in it for lack of a better way to say it. And it should all work out. I mean, that's what they always say, right? You know, if you love it, it'll work. It'll make, it'll pay your bills. You know, it won't happen overnight. I still struggle with that now myself. There's no easy answers, but I keep getting back to the true North of knowing that if I'm passionate about it and I believe in it, it will work. That's probably the best possible place to leave it. There's a heck of a lot there to, to that could help anybody out there. And there's a few people I definitely want to toss this podcast toward because I know it'll help them specifically. Mm. Laura, I love what you're doing here. I would love to have you back anytime. Everything we talked about, I'm going to make sure it goes in the show notes so that people have easy access to it. Where else can people follow your adventures on the web? Sure. Uh, Stargalnetwork.com is uh, my website. Okay. That's really where you're going to find me. If they want to listen to me weekly, uh, go on <laughs> uh, zodiacmagicpodcast.com, which is produced by Radio America, which is a great syndicate. Uh, we do terrific work on there. It's a great show. Hope to have you all listening. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.